you know, you know it. 
brought one, grab a Bible, turn with me to Ephesians 5. If you did not bring a Bible, go ahead and there, there should be a pew Bible, hopefully in the row behind you, right underneath the chairs. Um, if you don't have a pew Bible, if you didn't bring your own Bible, go ahead and grab that phone. But I do want you to look with me. We're looking at Ephesians 5, verses 22 and through 33 this morning. And what we are doing is we're working our way through Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus. Um, And we've noted that the second half of the book, which is chapters 4, 5, and 6, they largely follow the structure of the refrain to walk or to live. And so it's this expression that is referring to our lifestyle. It's our conduct. It's, It's kind of the direction and the course that our life is taking. And the basic idea is that Paul has laid these foundational truths out in the first three chapters of Ephesians, things that were like, you're dead in your trespasses. You were born the walking dead, spiritually dead. You you were a, a child of wrath. And yet Christ came in and he invaded your life and he made you alive by his grace. And he's raised you up with him in the heavenlies. And because of this grand reality of which is yours in Christ, Paul says that ought to shape, it ought to move, it should mold the way you live your life. And so we finished up last week looking at part of chapter 5 where Paul actually ends by saying, because of these realities, walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom, which is the dominant theme for the next portion of Ephesians. Walking in wisdom directly affects, it directly shapes relational dynamics between husbands and wives, between parents and children, and on as chapter 6 goes. So this part of Ephesians, just a little understanding before we dive in, this part of Ephesians is sometimes called the household code. The household code, which was actually a, something common within Greek ethics at the time that they referred to the household code. So Uh, it all followed the same familiar pattern that they talk about husbands and wives, they talk about parents and children, they talk about slaves and masters. And the general idea of the day is that you do this, uh, you structure your household in this way in light of the ethics that were established. And so what Paul does here is he's taking this familiar form of the household code and he radically transforms it. And he redraws the whole thing around Jesus Christ, which is crucial to understand because this is the part of Ephesians, more than any other, that is held with great contempt and anger. Paul is accused here of being patriarchal in his views of marriage. Paul is accused here of being impractical in his views of parenting. And Paul is accused here of being indefensible in the way that he seem, seemingly condones slavery. I have not caught as much flack in my five years here than I have this past two weeks talking to people about this passage. But as we're going to see this week and following, all those things are actually not true. And it's actually very unfair to place that. Actually, that's not at all what Paul is doing. He's actually transforming those kinds of things that were typical of the culture of the day. And one thing to notice, even before we dive in, is that the passage itself, just look at verse 21, it begins with this statement, submit to one another out of reverence of Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So right off the bat, Paul wants us to know, because we're going to be diving into marriage this morning, he wants to know that there is a kind of mutuality and reciprocity that he understands between the relationship between a husband and a wife. Now, that's complementary in nature, as we're going to see, but it's related to a higher purpose, which actually informs the way we look at and view marriage. And so with that, we're going to dive in. Follow along with me as I read Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. We'll, We'll start at 21, may as well. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in every way. 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you also must love your wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. For the last several years, the concept of marriage has been greatly discussed and greatly debated. I was going to pull just a couple interesting statistics about marriage uh, and divorce, actually, that the divorce rate is actually statistically not uh, significantly different for those between Christians and non-Christians. Did you know that? Did you know that back in 2021, there was one divorce every 13 seconds within the U.S.? We live in a time where the concept of marriage is really discussed and really debated. And there's actually this fascinating irony also taking place. There are two kinds of trends going on simultaneously. One of the trends is to push and say, you know, marriage is not really that big of a deal. Now, we know this simply by looking at how many people are cohabitating and opting not to get married. And so they say things like, you know, it's just a sheet of paper. It's really not that big of a deal. Practically speaking, nothing really changes. And yet, ironically, on the other hand, at the same time, our culture says that marriage is incredibly important. And because it's so important, we, could act- we should actually reconsider how we define it and reapply it to different kinds of arrangements. And so we, we have... Uh, we have all this happening at the same time. Marriage has been largely redefined and marginalized and abandoned, sort of all at the same time within our culture. And so when we come to a passage like this this morning, instead of doing what a lot of people tend to do, which is they see a couple words in the passage, they get really offended, and then they dismiss the whole thing, perhaps it would behoove you and I, given the confusion and the failure within our society, it would behoove us to say, what is Paul actually trying to say? What does God actually have? What are the profound and deep truths in the vision that God has for marriage? And so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to look at this in three parts. What is the calling of a wife? What is the calling of a husband? And what is the calling of a church? And so first we're going to start off with the calling of a wife. Notice what Paul says in verses 22 through 24. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. Uh, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is a savior. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So, the calling of a wife is simply this, submit to your husband. Okay, no reaction. I wasn't sure how that was going to land. Submit to your husband. Okay. Okay. What does that mean? Well, first of all, let's get out of the way what it doesn't mean. We know what what it doesn't mean is that wives are supposed to be in this enslaved position to their husbands, where the husbands get to boss them around and tell them what to do. uh, There's a pastor preacher by the name of Kent Hughes who once said that the truths of this text have been perverted and abused by disordered sinful men. God's word in the hands of fools can do immense harm. And he goes on to say that I've seen couch potatoes who have ordered their wives and children around like the Grand Sultan of Morocco. He said, I've seen misogynists with domestic ethics of Jabba the Hutt who have called their wives around with Bible verses about submission. 
He says, I've seen insecure men whose wives do not dare to the, go to the grocery store without permission or do not dress without first okaying it with their husbands. But Hughes goes on to say that the simple fact that evil and disordered men have perverted God's word is no reason to throw it out. Which is well put. Submission does not mean that a wife is in a slavish, slavish position in the marriage, where the husband just simply gets to boss her around. Nor does it mean that it's obedience. Okay, Most people assume that's what that means. Submission equals obedience. Because truthfully, as a culture, as a society, we have a weak and cowardly understanding of submission, which we're going to get to in a second. But it's, it very clearly does not mean obedience. And one of the reasons we know that is because in the other two parts of the three-part household code, Paul does use the word obedience. Just hop down, Ephesians 6.1, he says, children, obey your parents. Ephesians 6, 5, slaves, obey your master. So if Paul was talking about obedience, chances are he would probably use the word obedience. But the fact that Paul does not use that word, but instead opts for this posture of submission, should tell us that simple obedience is not what he has in mind. Nor does it mean submission means a sense of inferiority or any sort of less dignity. And we know that for a couple of reasons, logically and theologically. Logically, don't forget, this passage immediately begins in verse 21 by saying, submit to one another out of reverence of Christ. So there's a kind of submission where it goes both ways, which carries this equal value to both parties, which is even true theologically. Submission is something that actually occurs within the Trinity itself. Did you know that? That throughout the book of Ephesians, the reality of the Trinity is actually a vital part of understanding our redemption. And within the Trinity, as God carries out this work, that, that there's actually submission going on between the persons of God. And so we see things like the Son submits to the Father, Yet they're both equal in power and equal in glory. The Spirit comes along, and he submits to the Father and the Son, yet they're all three equal in being, equal in power, equal in glory. So it cannot carry with it. Submission cannot carry with it the notion of inferiority or lack of dignity. And so when Paul says, you know what, wives, submit to your husbands, he doesn't have in mind slavery. He does not have in mind simple obedience. And he has zero notion of inferiority um, or, or uh, a lack of dignity. So the question is, what does submission mean? And within God's kingdom, submission can be defined as deferring to one another for the purpose of building them up or honoring them. Let me say that again. Submission within God's kingdom simply means to defer to another, to either build them up or to honor them. And the easiest way for us to see this is to go back to the Trinity itself. The Son submits to the Father, or he defers to the Father. And so he says something like, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Well, what's he doing? He, he's bringing the Father honor. He's, he's bringing the Father glory. The Holy Spirit, as God is carrying out his work, defers to the Father and the Son. Why? To bring them honor. So, submission has nothing to do with capacity, or capability, rather. It has nothing to do with dignity. It has nothing to do with slavish obedience. It is simply deferring to one another for the sake of building them up or honoring them. And I think the best way to think about this is by watching Dancing with the Stars. You guys have seen Dancing with the Stars, right? Okay, okay. Dancing with the Stars, if you've ever watched it, even if you haven't watched it, it basically follows a traditional way of dancing. And how dancing works is it typically works because the man and the woman dance with each other. The man takes a lead, and the woman responds. And as they're dancing, one of the things that you actually cannot tell if they're doing a good job is who's leading and who's responding. They simply move together in harmony. That, that they're in sync with one another. Now, one of the most interesting things about Dancing with the Stars and, and what happens on the show is a scenario where the man is a contestant and the woman is a professional dancer. 
right? Because clearly the woman is more gifted. Clearly the mo- woman is more experienced. She, she's more, uh, she has more training. She has more expertise. She's more competent all around. And yet what does she, she does not do on the dance floor is jerk him around and make him look like an idiot. She does not take every opportunity she has to try and upstage him so that she looks good and he looks bad. She does not say, forget it, you idiot. I'm just going to go do my own thing. Rather, what does she do? She treats him with respect and responsiveness. And she works with him so that he can grow. He can develop into the dancer he's supposed to be. And sometimes that means that she gives guidance. Sometimes it means she gives direction that that there may be some situations where she's taking the lead in order to help him get the hang of it. But it's all done out of this posture of respect and responsiveness that is actually trying to build him up and seeks to honor him. And something like that is what Paul has in mind when he says, uh, the way that wives approach their marriage with their husbands is that there are times where you provide guidance. There are going to be times when you provide direction. You may take the leadership in some areas. You may be more gifted. You may be more talented. You may be more experienced. You may have more expertise. You may have more competency. But you approach it in a way that helps your husband become the man that God is calling him to be. To respond to him, as verse 33 says, to treat him with respect so he's able to live into the manhood that God has called him to be. Which is very different than how our culture, uh, the women in our culture, approach marriage. Is it not? Many women have figured out not how to build their man up, but how to make them feel less sure of themselves. They know how to give a cutting remark. They know how to give them a look. They know how to say something in public. They know how to take him down a notch in front of other people so that they can better control their husbands. I know some wives who have perfected the art of withholding affection or nagging or using one of the many forms of relational uh, blackmail in order to manipulate and bully their husbands to get them to do what they want them to do. And yet Paul says that the calling of a wife is actually not to control your husband. It's actually not to tear him down, he says, but to respond to him, to treat him with respect in such a way that he's actually built up and he's actually honored. And the question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? I mean, especially, what if my husband is difficult? What if he's immature? What if he's childish? What if he's ungodly? How am I to do that? How do I defer to him or respond to him in such a way where I'm trying to build him up and honor him? And Paul says that the way you do that is actually by viewing your calling as a wife theologically. Notice what he says in verse 22. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Verse 24. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Meaning, the way you approach your relationship with your husband is to see it in the larger context in your relationship with Jesus. Approach it like you do your relationship with Jesus. So, if your husband's being very, very difficult, not that we ever are, but if he is, you say to your own heart, well, I love Jesus, and I'm going to love my husband as an expression of, for my love for Jesus. And even if he's being difficult, I'm going to seek to honor him because I want to express how much I want to honor Christ. So in ways, you see your husband, but you see through your husband to Jesus. Does that make sense? And to say, I'm going to love him, and through loving him, I'm going to express a love for Christ. And Paul says, that is the way your heart actually begins to change when you start to relate to your husband in the larger context in your relationship with Christ, of understanding the way you treat him, in a sense, is an expression or a picture of how the church ought to respond to Christ. And so you can also love your husband and at the same time in prayer say, you know, God, I'm just going to give him to him. Give him to you. 
I'm going to love him as I love you. I'm going to honor him as an expression of how I honor you. I'm going to treat him with respect because I'm going to treat you with respect. And then, Lord, you build him up and you grow him in only ways you can. I'm going to do my part. And, Lord, I'm going to ask that you do your part. But I'm going to be blameless in this. And Paul says, that is the calling of a wife. Now, what is the calling of a husband? And as we come to the calling of the husband, I think it's important to recognize that when Paul begins addressing the husbands, this is actually the more challenging thing he says. And sometimes it's hard for us to see that. Uh, We come to this passage in our 21st century modern way of thinking, and so we read the part about wives, and we say, whoa, wait a minute. No, what do you mean by this? Wives submit to your... What the heck does that mean? You have no idea. But that's actually not the part of the passage that would have stumbled the early church. Paul's original original audience would not have been that way at all. The, The wives would have read verses 22 and 24 and gone, oh, okay. I mean, I'm pretty much doing that already. Little tweaking here and there, but that's... That's, I'm not too far off. It actually would have been the, Paul's words to the husband that would have been offensive. Where people would have said, wait a second. Paul, what in the world do you mean by this? Notice what he says in verses 25 through 30. Husbands, love your wives just that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, nobody's ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. Verse 30, for we are members of his body. So the calling of a husband is this, is to love his life, his wife, sacrificially. Husbands, your role, your calling that God has placed on you is to love your wife sacrificially, just as Jesus loved the church. The calling of a husband is to lay down his life for the sake of his bride. The calling for a husband is to give himself emotionally, relationally, spiritually, physically for the good of his bride. I remember hearing a pastor once say when I was young, and it it must have been profound because it still stuck with me, he said something to this effect. Many men, I think, are willing to lay down their lives if that means dying for their bride. But far fewer men are willing to lay down their lives if it means getting up on a cold Tuesday morning and preheating the car for her. And I think he's on to something. Most men, if somebody came up to him and said, I have one bullet in my gun, it's you or your bride, most men would say, okay, I'll do it. Most men, I think, are willing to lay down their lives for their wife if it means dying for them. But far fewer men are willing to lay down their lives if that means living for them. Because in some ways, that is actually the harder calling. And Paul says that the calling of a husband is to lay down his life for his wife, to love her sacrificially. The calling of the husband is actually to go into every single day and say, Lord, how can I love her more deeply? God, how are you calling me to lay down my life for the sake of my wife today? How can I love her more sacrificially, more completely as Christ loved the church today? And that would mean, for instance, actually listening to her. When you come home, you're exhausted and you really don't feel like listening. That would actually mean doing a chore when you're tired, but you know it would bless her if you did it. It would mean surprising her in simple ways just to show you care and value and cherish her. It would mean putting her needs ahead of your needs. It would mean looking for ways to provide and assure her that she is secure in this relationship. It would mean taking an active interest in supporting her so that she can turn around and use her gifts, she can use her talents and abilities to become the woman that God is calling her to be. All this means is that you actually have an active and engaged posture with your wife and your family. It's active and it's engaged. And I think a lot of people, when they come to this passage, they get super nervous 
because they read it, and they fear that a passage like this is going to give men ammunition to become domineering and authoritative and abusive to their wives. And though sadly, that is that is 100% happened. The text has been twisted that way. In my experience, that is actually not the frustration of women. For every woman who's beaten down by a husband who's domineering, there are 20 women who are frustrated with a husband who is passive, who just simply will not engage with her or the kids. They're frustrated because their husband won't make any decisions regarding the family. He won't help with the discipline of the children. He comes and goes without any regard of her feelings. He cares more about his hobbies than he does their family. He comes home in the evening. He just wants to be left alone so he can watch TV. He doesn't take any initiative around the house, and then he drags his feet when he's asked. He never takes the lead for family devotionals or prayer. He is basically self-absorbed, self-contained, and non-responsive, and simply leaves everything to the wife. And though nobody wants a husband who's domineering or authoritative or abusive, there are many women who long for a husband who's not passive, but is active. They want him to be engaged, not aloof. They want him to take some initiative, some leadership, instead of letting everything simply fall to her. And Paul says that husbands are called to love their wives sacrificially. And that means being proactive. That means being engaged. That means actively willing to lay down your life sacrificially for her. Does that make sense? There's a story, um, it was about 25 years ago. Christianity Today ran an article telling the story of Robert and Muriel McQuilkin. And Robert was a college president, and Muriel had developed Alzheimer's. And as things progressed, obviously things got much worse. And so for a couple years, Robert was able to fulfill his role as college president. But he began to find out that Muriel um, was actually very content when he'd stay home. But the minute he left, she got very agitated. In fact, the house was about a mile away from the college, and Muriel would walk, wandering towards the college to find her husband. She'd make that trip about 10 times a day. So much so that when Robert came home and he's getting Muriel for bed, he'd take off her shoes, and her feet would be bloody from all the steps, just kind of frantically looking for him. And so Robert, to everybody's surprise, resigned his presidency at the college so he could spend full time at home taking care of his bride. And so when Christianity ran the article, it actually provoked this huge response, one of the biggest responses in the magazine's history. And uh, it, it did it in such a way that um, they did a follow-up with Robert. And he seemed at first to be taken back by all the responses. People are mailing in, you know, Robert's story. They made us renew our vows. It completely reshaped how I view my marriage and all this stuff. So Christianity Today did a follow-up. And he said, at first I was taken back until I spoke with a distinguished oncologist. Somebody who's around death every single day. And the oncologist once told me, almost all women stand by their men. But few men stand by their women. And Paul says, the calling of a husband is to stand by your wife in life and in death, to lay down your life, to be willing to sacrifice for her, to love her so deeply that it actually begins to resemble the way that Christ loves the church. And why does he ask? Why does he say that husbands are called to do this? And it says, for the very same reason that Christ has sacrificially loved the church, the way he has so that the church might become radiant and beautiful, is how Paul says it. So that the church might be without stain or blemish. And kind of taking the analogy over, the reason that husbands are called to love their wives in this way, sacrificially, is so that the wife might become spiritually beautiful and splendid and glorious. And so my question for you husbands is this. Is your wife more Christ-like because she's married to you? or in spite of being married to you? Is your wife more spiritually beautiful 
Is she becoming holier? Is she becoming radiant in her walk with Christ because she's married to you or in spite of being married to you? How do we do that? Myself included. Little uh, secret. It's been a hard two weeks. And so just about every other day, I turn to my wife, Clary, and say, I'm trying. I'm going to preach this gospel to myself. How do we, myself included, begin to love our wives in this way? And I'm convinced that a great number of problems in our marriages could be remedied if husbands could love their wives the way that Christ loves the church. So how do we do that? And it's actually the same way that wives are called to fulfill their calling. We have to view our calling as husbands theologically. Paul says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Don't forget, you and I are the church. And so the way that we love our wives sacrificially is to understand and apply the way that Christ himself loved us. The way that Christ has laid down his life for us. The way that Jesus has selflessly set aside his own self-interest for us. So that, when we begin to understand that, when we apply that in our lives, that actually begins to come in and change our hearts so that we turn around and we start expressing that same kind of love towards our wives. So that we love our wives, it actually becomes a picture or an expression of the way Jesus loved the church. And so, let me give you a couple examples. It's a cold Tuesday morning. It's coming up, not to burst your bubble. Cold Tuesday morning, you're still in your warm bed and your wife has to leave for work before you. You might say to yourself, how has Jesus loved me? Christ left the comforts of heaven in complete fellowship with the Father, and he came and he lived and he died for you. Christ took your burden. So you can take, you can get out of that comfortable bed, and you can proactively surprise your wife and take that burden away from her. Do you see it? It's the way Christ loved me, so I'm going to share that. I'm going to shed that on my wife. Another one, when you come home from work, it's just been one of those weeks. You're beat, you're tired. All you really want to do is plop down, disengage, and unplug. But you can tell your wife has just had one of those days where she just really needs to talk. You might say to yourself, well, how has Christ treated me? Christ set aside his self-interests in order to die on the cross for me. Christ was willing to lay down his life for my sins. And if Christ loved me that way, if Christ was so interested in me that way, that he's willing to shed his blood, then I can turn around towards my wife and invest in her and be interested in her. Do you see it? How Christ did, then we share it. We should, Paul says that is the calling of a husband, to love your wives sacrificially, as Christ loves the church. So, Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, sacrificially love your wives. The calling of marriage. Notice how Paul finishes the passage. He begins with a quote in verse 31. He begins by quoting Genesis 2. And as he does, it's important to see what Paul has in mind. That as husbands and wives are loving each other, as there's kind of this uh, reciprocal nature going on of putting the other person first, where wives, you're deferring to your husbands to build them up. Husbands, you're loving your wives in order to build them up. There, there's just mutuality going on. Paul says when that begins to happen, marriage actually becomes something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That something else begins to show up in the midst of it. Notice how he says in verse 31, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and become united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then he unpacks it in verse 32. He says, This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And so when husbands and wives begin living out this kind of Christ-like love for one another, that marriage actually becomes a little window that begins to open up. And you begin to see something profound and glorious being revealed in the midst of that. And what it is, it's a mystery between Christ and the church. Now, don't miss the significance of this. 
Because what Paul is not saying is, listen, you have this thing called marriage, and it's great. It's wonderful. You commit to each other. You love one another. Yeah, and you know, and this is kind of how Jesus relates to the church. Paul actually says the opposite. He says, if you go back to Genesis 2, that is actually pointing to Christ in the church. That's the basis and then human marriage is then defined by, it it's, takes its cues from, it, it's a revelation of that relationship. In other words, what we see between Jesus and the church, that's the grand structure of the whole thing between a man and a wife. And if you went all the way back to the beginning, when in Genesis when Genesis starts describing the creation account, if you ever notice how God created, God makes complementary pairs. And so, for instance, he makes things like day and night. He makes things like light and darkness, heaven and earth, land and sea, and then culminating with God making what? Male and female. It's all about these complementary pairs being created so that they may work together towards something bigger. And then, when you get to the end of the story in Revelation, you have the heavens and the earth being brought together. It's the same heaven and earth from Genesis. Being brought together in this grand act of redemption. Cosmic redemption going on here. And John paints a picture of what at the end of Genesis, uh, Revelation? A marriage supper. Do you see the connections? It, it, marriage itself, what I'm trying to say, is a living illustration for us to understand God's grand purpose between heaven and earth, between God and his people, between Christ and his church. It shows, it reflects God's cosmic redemption in what's going on. And we see a window into that as both the husband and the wife are fulfilling their callings to Christ in this thing called marriage. And that is why, fundamentally and theologically, marriage can only exist between a male and a female. It just can't be a convenient arrangement where two people just commit to each other. It has to be complementary pairs providing, being brought together so that they might be a signpost for the way that God loves his people. So it might be a signpost to how God will bring the heavens and the earth together at the end of time. And so the calling of a marriage is to be this kind of relationship between a husband and wife that just kind of opens up the window. It discloses, it, it reveals this profound, divine mystery of Christ in the church. And so all that being said, my question for you is, what kind of picture does your marriage give off? What kind of picture does your marriage have? Now, for some of us in this room, it, that might be a painful question. Because maybe your particular marriage does not give up much resemblance between Christ and the church. And so the question like that, it might give off feelings of disappointment or resentment or pain. But even if that is your particular case, all the more reason to look towards your heavenly bridegroom, all the more reason to look to the spouse who will love you only as he can. And even if your spouse does not love you, as you might hope he or she would, you have a heavenly bridegroom who does. So wives, continue loving your husbands. Seek to build them up. Seek to help them grow and develop and honor him. Husbands, continue loving your wives sacrificially as Christ loved the church. And the wonderful thing is, is that God's glory can shine through even the most lopsided of marriages because that too is a picture between Christ and the church. And so friends, don't write this passage off. This whole passage should cause us to rest and rejoice in the ultimate bridegroom, which is Jesus himself. And so we turn to him, we worship him. I'm going to ask that you join me as we pray to him. Father, we praise you and we worship you and we glorify you and we seek you in this time. And God, we do praise you.
we do praise you for the gift of marriage. Lord, way back in the beginning, as you're making all of your creation, it was all good. And then you said, man was alone and that is not good. And so you made the woman and you called them. And Father, I thank you that that's your viewpoint. That this thing we're working out, this thing that is so challenging at times, this thing that's so life-giving at times, this thing that's so confusing at times, God, that this was actually your design, that you created this. And so, God, I pray that not only that reality that you're the author, but I also pray that you as a great physician would step into our marriages that we may be carrying into this morning, God. For some of our marriages that, that just, there's a lot of re- built up resentment, there's a lot of pain, there's a, just a lot of confusion there. God, I pray that you would heal wounds and you'd bring redemption in the midst of this so that you'd shine the glory of the gospel through it. And Father, we praise you and we pray for continual strength for these marriages here that do reflect, God, the grace of of your cosmic redemption. And God, I pray for fuel to continue walking down that road. And yet, Father, at the same time, there are many of us here this morning that just have not been called yet or have been called to another season post-marriage. And in that, God, I pray against the loneliness God, I pray against the heartache. I I, I pray against the longing that doesn't come from you. And I pray, God, that even in those tender, hard moments, Jesus, I pray that your grace would flood in and help us to see who struggle in those ways, that we do have a perfect bridegroom who's up in heaven waiting for us, cheering us on and loving us and lavishing grace on us, to stay faithful to him in the days to follow. So Jesus, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, we lift up all these things to you. In your name, praying the prayer you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus.
be up here, we just want to pray with you and for you. So I'm going to invite you to that following the service. That being said, I want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes and receive this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace because the Father knows you and loves you. The Son lived, died, and rose again on behalf of you and sent the Holy Spirit to invade your life with his powerful grace to enable you to keep going for the glory of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.